I'm really uh, pleased to be here with this uh, really fine program and a really important program, and we can see that in part by the number of you that have stayed uh, through many hours of, of discussion. Um, there are so many here. Uh, it's, it's a subject that I know is important. I hear from constituents. Uh, it is very much on their minds. Uh, I get letters on the subject of gun violence, uh, phones, faxes, and so forth daily. Um, it's a concern to me personally that I've been involved in throughout my years in Congress um, when it has been on the agenda and when it hasn't been on the agenda. Most of the time, it has not been on the agenda. Uh, now, uh, I think we have a moment of political possibility. Uh, there was a setback in the Senate uh, recently, but I still think there will be some uh, gun safety legislation yet uh, this year, not just this Congress. Um, but it will be far from what we need, which gets me to the central point I want to make, which is we don't know what we need, uh, which is why your discussion today is so important, because it is something that is missing on Capitol Hill. Um, successfully reducing deaths and injury from gun violence um, must involve consideration of a of a number of, of factors, um, criminal screening and mental health issues and violence in the media and entertainment and video games and the culture of gun ownership uh, and um, many other things. Um, but I think that arguments that uh, gun control legislation has, uh, uh, has no place are uh, illogical and ideological. Um, you've heard today from a number of experts uh, about how this is a public health issue, uh, with 85 people a day being killed or injured by guns. Uh, we we must call gun. We must recognize that gun violence is a public health issue, but more than to name it. Uh, we must ask whether considering it as a public health issue, taking a public health approach, will help solve the problem, even an ill-defined problem. Well, I would argue that approaching it as a public health issue will help us define the problem. Um, and in fact, part of the problem that we face and maybe the biggest hurdle that we face uh, is that members of Congress don't think of this as a public health issue. Um, and some react adversely to the suggestion that we should think about it as a public health issue. But it is, it is not just NRA, National Rifle Association, propaganda that says this is not a public health issue. There is a true aversion among members of Congress to deal in numbers, in models, in the idea of controlled and measured programs. Um, and we need to do that uh, to understand and to be able to deal uh, rationally with the problem. Um, David Hemingway and, and uh, and another uh, public health specialist, uh, Matthew Miller, published a piece in last week's New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and Hemingway and Miller believe that a public health approach to this problem uh, would have five key uh, components. That a public health approach is population-based and rarely involves uh, identifiable individuals. And I should pause at this point to say, I feel a little bit um, uh, handicapped here because I've missed a good part of today's discussion. And maybe these have already been uh, covered, but at risk of 
of constructive repetition, I will uh, <laughs> uh, go through these. So that it, it's population-based and rarely involves identifiable individuals. Uh, second, that it's prevention-focused. Third, that it uses a systems approach. Fourth, that it's broad and inclusive, looking at all possible interventions. And as I suggested at the beginning, there are many aspects to the problem, and one might presume there are many possible interventions. And fifth, the public health model emphasizes shared responsibility over blame. Uh, you've heard that uh, quite a bit today. And uh, a public health approach helps us uh, to understand that we, our community, uh, owns this problem and not just the bad actors. Um, this kind of discussion is rare on Capitol Hill. Uh, members of Congress, members of Congress think of themselves as experts in human motivation. And in many cases, they are. But it's done in a unsystematic approach. Um, what I think is especially relevant is the idea that in order to tackle the problem properly, we have to have reliable, verifiable data um, that comes from asking the right questions. And Hemingway and Miller discuss the parallels, and you have today, discuss the parallels between gun violence and the efforts, uh, for example, to uh, reduce deaths from motor vehicle accidents. Fatalities per mile driven are down dramatically, more than 80% uh, over, you know, over the decades. This is due to a systematic look at the problem that has uh, led uh, to legislation and regulations having to do with seat belts and collapsible steering columns and better design of guardrails and on-ramps um, and so forth. Um, this, in this case, in the case of motor vehicle deaths, uh, to some extent we've gotten beyond blaming who caused the accident, the person who caused the accident, to seeking information about what caused the accident. Um, public health um, works this way. You, own, you can go back to Dr. Snow in London, who uh, famously uh, graphed, uh, plotted on a map the incidence of cholera and found that it was clustered around certain wells. Or forensic epidemiologists who began looking for a trail of typhoid and tracked down Typhoid Mary, who, who, who um, uh, belligerently refused to wash her hands. Um, you know, this goes back a, a century ago. Um, so just as we can ask, why can't we make cars safer, and what can we do to discourage drinking and driving? Uh, uh, what benefit can we get from uh, uh, restaurant employees washing their hands or uh, public health testing of wells? Um, we can, I think, uh, tease out some things that we should do uh, in a complicated, multifactorial problem. Um, You've heard, um, it should go without saying, but it probably doesn't uh, uh, go without saying, I mean, uh, it might go without saying, but maybe shouldn't go without saying that here in the United States, we have the most guns, the most access to guns, uh, the loosest controls, uh, and by far the highest rates of gun suicide, uh, gun homicide, and accidental gun death of any society with which we would want to compare ourselves. Um, at the beginning of the 113th Congress, this January, I reintroduced again and again, as I have over the years, my Handgun Licensing and Registration Act. Um, 
I introduced it early on, so it has the number HR 117. It's modeled on New Jersey's own law, uh, which we've lived with quite comfortably for a long time. Hunters, homeowners, gun enthusiasts, um, police, uh, we've learned to live with quite comfortably with uh, licensing and registration of handguns here. I, I've supported, since I first ran for Congress, uh, against someone who voted to repeal, uh, voted against the assault weapons bill uh, uh, ban. I voted uh, to keep that in effect. And when it was reintroduced earlier this year by my colleague Carolyn McCarthy, I was, uh, I, I, I became a co-sponsor of that. I'm a supporter of bills to ban large capacity magazines, to close the so-called gun show loophole, to ban online sales of ammunition and so forth. But all of these things are scattershot. I don't know, yes, <laughs> in a deliberate pun, uh, but, uh, deliberate, but, uh, but all of these things are um, uh, somewhat unfocused because Congress doesn't know, partly by deliberate ignorance, but mostly by an unwillingness and a, and a lack of facility in dealing with things from a public health perspective, what the problem is and where are the most effective points to address it. Uh, by the way, as an aside last year, a member of my staff purchased 200 rounds of ammunition online. I mentioned the online registration um, with just a credit card. No other ID was required, no background check. Um, contrast that, by the way, with congressionally mandated uh, restrictions on over-the-counter medicines that contain uh, ingredients that could be used to uh, make meth. Um, uh, under that law, which was part of the Patriot Act, by the way, uh, the Patriot Act renewal, uh, you have to present at the druggist, at the drugstore, a uh, driver's license and other photo ID, sign for the medication. Uh, the information goes into a database, and I'm told, although I don't have uh, specifics on this, that um, they, the uh, drug agencies actually uh, track the purchases to see if there are patterns. I'm not clear how effective that procedure has been, but it is generally regarded by my colleagues as effective. Um, but even if we add additional measures to this unfocused program, um, buyback programs, which we see in some cities and some states, or anti-gun trafficking and straw purchase measures and so on, all of which I'm inclined to support, um, we still have a larger social problem uh, the prevailing attitudes about guns, and we still have the problem of figuring out what is the problem. Um, most people think we understand the problem, but yet when you see that it's only in reaction to the uh, Aurora or um, uh, uh, Sandy Hook, Connecticut shootings and so forth, that we have, that we have, we find political motivation to do anything. Um, it it suggests that we're not responding to the ongoing day after day uh, violent deaths, which far outnumber. And by the way, a hundred thousand, you know, kind of seventy thousand injuries beyond the injuries that result in death. Um, that go far beyond the relatively small number of people who are killed in the mass shootings. Um, we lapse into discussions about self-defense, um, about uh, preparing to guard against uh, invasion or insurrection. Um, we... Uh, say that the federal government shouldn't be involved in advocacy, hence the Dickey Amendment that prevents the CSC, CDC from spending funds to, uh, to really understand, from an epidemiological point of view, uh, the gun problem. Uh, because Dickey said 
the CDC shouldn't be involved in advocacy. <laughs> now, clearly he was motivated by uh, NRA propaganda, because I, I, I know Jay Dickey, uh, and I knew him when he was a member of Congress, but the fact that it prevailed in Congress um, also suggested that um, there wasn't a good understanding of just how much the CDC could contribute to understanding this. And now, as you know, this year the president uh, said, ordered, in fact, that research would resume at the CDC, and he directed them to spend $10 million, um, you know, for the size of the problem, where deaths from guns will if they haven't already exceeded this year highway deaths, uh, they soon will in, in coming years, at the rate we're going anyway. Uh, $10 million is a fairly paltry sum, I think. But, um, you know, with 6,000 handgun deaths, 2,000 more might be from handguns, from unspecified guns, and with uh, uh, so many thousands uh, of, of deaths by suicide, uh, which I think should be counted in any gun violence uh, statistics. The, uh, some of the gun advocates like to uh, dismiss that and say, oh, but you're just talking about suicides. Uh, evidently, they haven't experienced the family violence that is a suicide. Um, and or, or they wouldn't they wouldn't say that um, uh, they wouldn't understand uh, they, they evidently don't understand that whereas suicides by say pill overdoses are uh, success uh, are uh, I don't won't use that term are completed uh, the attempt is completed uh, less than five percent of the time whereas with a gun it's more than eighty percent of the time. Um, we need to understand whether safe storage laws really do affect suicides uh, and accidental uh, juvenile deaths. Uh, we need the data. And Congress should not just get out of the way and let people collect the data. Congress should be directing that we collect the data. But it's a societal problem that I, as a scientist, encounter often. Um, whether you go back to the National Defense Education Act of 1958 or something else in American society where those who aren't professional scientists um, and their representatives in Congress choose not to think numerically uh, in probabilistic and statistical terms. Uh, don't think about causality and sensitive, sensitivity uh, 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 um, calculations. Um, just as, uh, well, whether it deals with suicide or accidents uh, for people without seat belts, um, we've got to do a better job collecting the data and thinking uh, in uh, like a, uh, well, uh, thinking like public health providers. Um, and it's not just members of Congress. I do want to make that point. Uh, when I was talking about gun safety recently, somebody said to me, oh, but don't you know that uh, is, I don't know whether the woman who spoke, who is from Belgium is still here, uh, uh, Belgium is still here. But this person said to me, well, don't you know that in Belgium, uh, per capita, more people die for, by gunfire than in the United States. And I said, I don't think so. Um, I didn't have the numbers at my fingertips. But the point was, this person was just parroting something that he had gotten from some gun, gun advocates uh, and didn't, uh, you know, uh, didn't have the the interest in checking it uh, because it was numerical. You know, it must be factual 
And well, I, you know, who am I to, to, to question numbers and to think numerically, uh, he, he might say, um, because that's the way so many Americans think. Um, One of the, of course, most important obstacles to changing attitudes about guns in our society is the NRA. Uh, we saw that in the Senate earlier this year. Their power to derail even the most common sense and publicly supported safety measures. Um, and despite efforts of groups like Mayors Against Illegal Guns and the Brady Campaign and others, the gun lobby still maintains an edge in money spent and in effective organization in many states around the country. Their numbers are not so large, but a point of basic political science that is often lost on people is that you don't have to have a majority of the people to have a large effect on uh, legislators. Um, if you have enough people who are committed and can surely make a change of a percent or two or three in an election, you've got power. Uh, the legislators are never quite sure when they're gonna be in an election that's that close. And if they know there is this litmus test organization that uh, will, 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 will brook no compromise, um, that organization has power. Has power. Um, now, whereas in the previous era of automobile safety, um, automobile manufacturers at first were on the defensive and then came around to understanding that not only must they include seat belts, uh, but it was in their interest to make vehicles safer. Uh, we've seen something quite the opposite from the NRA <coughs> that uh, doesn't recognize that it might actually help gun sales uh, if, they were, if they were done in a responsible way. Um, and so they uh, want to uh, uh, prevent lawsuits, as we heard earlier today, and they want to prevent the collection of data. It's, um, and, it, uh, and part of their argument has been um, not to allow any legislation to come forward until we really can solve the problem, which has not been the case, say, in auto safety. Uh, a number of partial solutions have added up over time to a greatly effective uh, change in the design and operation of automobiles. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, I, I may be getting off the subject a little bit, but it's something I hear about and heard about even today, I hear about so often, um, people saying, you know, did you know that with Obamacare, Nancy Pelosi said, you'll have to pass this bill so we can find out what's in it. <laughs> You've heard that, right? I mean, it's nonsense. You know, here's one of the smartest people you'll ever meet uh, in public life or any place else with the biggest piece of legislation in her career, and people are claiming she didn't know what it was, that's preposterous. But it is true that there are provisions in the Affordable Care Act that we won't know how they work until they are applied. You know, we've put provisions in there to encourage people to go into primary care medicine, forgiveness of, of tuition, higher reimbursement rates, uh, Will it be enough to entice enough people to go into primary care to deliver as necessary under the, we don't know. We'll find out, won't we? We don't know whether the guardrail design and the on-ramp design of the, of, that is mandated in the transportation bill some years back were good enough 
to cut down traffic deaths. But we saw how they work, modified them as necessary, and now they work. So part of the approach to say we can't deal with this until we really have comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive solution to the problem um, is really uh, preposterous. Um, there is, there are some partial gains. We've had successes. Uh, let me give you something listed by the Center for American Progress last week. Here's a list of what has happened uh, uh, in the last uh, year or two. Colorado enacted a ban on high capacity magazines and instituted universal background checks. California passed uh, a statute providing 24 million for confiscating illegally owned weapons that the police had identified but didn't have the resources to seize. Georgia uh, killed a bill at the end of the last legislative session that would have allowed concealed carry in churches, courthouses, and college campuses. Maryland enacted one of the most sweeping new gun laws, uh, including an assault weapons ban and restriction on magazine size and a requirement that all gun purchasers get a license and submit a fingerprint sample. Uh, Rhode Island is considering an omnibus gun bill supported by Governor Lincoln Chafee that would set up a police registry of guns to track crime guns and uh, making it harder to get a concealed carry permit. Delaware passed a universal background check law um, in May, um, even as the U.S. Senate, under pressure from the NRA, was killing a similar measure. Uh, the Wyoming legislature, which can be quite hostile to gun regulation, voted down a bill authorizing that teachers carry guns. Um, New York strengthened its already strong gun law laws, uh, including a stricter assault weapon and high capacity magazine ban. And Connecticut passed a comprehensive package. Um, Nevada passed a universe, universal background checks in May. So these are all important victories, but they show that at least at the state level and under the right circumstances, the gun lobby can be outmaneuvered and proponents of public safety can prevail. Uh, but these are offset by states that have gone in the opposite direction um, and have failed to update their gun laws. Um, just this past Friday, the New York Times featured an interesting piece on the fallout of Connecticut's law uh, where firearms manufacturers uh, are now talking about moving out of state uh, because of the assault weapons ban in Connecticut. Um, the owner of Stag Arms from Connecticut told the reporter uh, that uh, they are getting lots of offers. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham offered, so did Paul Ryan in Texas and Oklahoma, well, all of them. This is what I came back to when I opened the mail. Indiana, Arkansas, Maine, the Oklahoma House of Representatives. This is from Jackson County, Kansas. Well, here's Bob Riley of Alabama. These offers just keep coming in for our factory to move. <laughs> so. You can have great gun laws. Ours in New Jersey, you've heard again and again today, are good. But uh, I think the principal reason that we continue to have uh, uh, gun over here, gun deaths in Camden and elsewhere, um, is because our laws are undercut by lax laws uh, nearby. Um, it's uh, why I came to believe a long time ago that we have to address this nationally. Uh, it's why I have introduced the licensing and registration language uh, for, uh, for handgun sales. Uh, it's why mandatory instant background checks uh, are essential on a national level. But background checks won't stop suicides and accidental deaths. Uh, perhaps they won't even stop most homicides. And uh, it's unlikely that they'll stop impulsive uh, killings. Um, so we can do some things to change how guns are manufactured. Uh, John Tierney, my colleague from Massachusetts, uh, has a bill that I support that would make grants available for um, development of personalized handguns. Uh, how many children's lives would be saved if having gained access to a parent's loaded weapon they were unable to fire it? Um, how many lives could would be saved if through the simply 
uh, having a prevention uh, that if the clip is removed, the gun can't be fired. So many deaths occur, evidently, when someone says, well, I pulled the clip out of the gun. How was I to know that there was still a bullet in the chamber? Um, uh, the, uh, there are, um, you know, no private gun owner who had a weapon stolen would have to worry about it being used if there were smart technology built into the gun. But just as in highway safety, it's not necessarily the highest tech solution that we need. Seat belts are not particularly high tech. Um, similarly, it would be quite simple to prevent the gun from firing if the clip is removed. Um, so uh, there certainly are uh, some technological measures that could be uh, required. When individual states could mandate that these and other safety and tracking technologies be in all guns sold in their state, um, I think uh, we won't hear about people moving from state to state either to buy their guns or factories moving from state to state uh, to manufacture their guns. But I think we'll only achieve these if we do it on a national scale. Um, and furthermore, just as uh, with Typhoid Mary, um, if we start on a national scale, uh, we will have multiple benefits from the actions we take. Um, getting restaurant workers to wash their hands not only stops the spread of typhoid, uh, it is a potent public health measure. Um, similarly, Australia has found that banning semi-automatic guns, that they, the semi-automatic rifles, which is what they did after a mass shooting uh, of some, uh, I forget what year it was, but it was kind of 15 years ago. Okay, pretty close to, okay, 17 years ago. Um, they have found um, real changes. Uh, the, the, the homicide rate is cut in half. Maybe you've discussed this already today. But the, the point there is, um, if we would get started, we would, we would start to see changes beyond what we would expect from the individual uh, legislation and regulations that we would uh, apply. We need a new politics that makes it unacceptable for any group or legislator to stand in the way of measures that will save lives and make our communities safer. And we need a better approach, a more scientific, analytical, data-based approach with statistics, with people thinking like, thinking about public health to help us understand what do we mean by saving lives and making communities safer. So we need a new politics that replaces the culture of gun with a culture that cherishes the lives of kids, but we also need a new politics that values data. Um, if the you know, massacre of 20 school children uh, provides a motivation, we have to couple that with discussions such as you are having today and uh, intensive data collection, analysis, and epidemiological public health uh, research that can direct that motivated response into um, uh, practical, effective um, results. Some of the answers are obvious. We need organized efforts. Uh, the continued ability of the organization like the NRA to kill these has to be offset by organized response. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've come to realize that the change in attitude about uh, whether there is climate change and whether it's deleterious to 
human health and well-being wasn't just a change of public mood. It was a well-organized, highly, heavily funded effort at disinformation. Um, and so too with guns, we need an organized response to organized disinformation. Um, we do know from our own history that progress is possible. Um, it's established that the government can ban specific types of weapons. The National Firearms Act, you know, decades ago prohibited the sale or possession of, of bazookas and shotguns and saw, you know, sawed off shotguns and, and Tommy guns and so forth. Um, the Supreme Court, in a flawed decision, never the, uh, saying that there was an individual right, uh, nevertheless uh, did allow for restrictions in the sale and use of guns uh, and in certain kinds of guns. So uh, we can do it if we only knew what to do. Uh, we need a renewed commitment to a national approach, um, and we need a public health scientific approach to pull that off. Thank you.